I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're excited to present a remarkable book to you. It is called God's Love is Different, a biblical theology on the love of God by Jeffrey Rogers. This insightful book dives deep into biblical texts, exploring the multifaceted nature of God's love through law, history, poetry, and more, reflecting Pastor Jeff's extensive experience in ministry and spiritual teaching. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing this wonderful book. Pastor Jeff, great to see you here today on Spotlight. It's really good to see you too. And thank you for having me. My I'm being interviewed by a very honorable man. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, the pleasure is mine and right back at you. It's my honor as well, that's for sure. This book is, I presume, an outgrowth of your ministry? Yes. Um, look, when we're talking about the love of God, everybody thinks that they've got it all figured out. You know, you're telling somebody that God loves them and they'll say, yeah, 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 I know that. It's an easy thing to consider. But um, when you're talking about understanding God from a revelatory perspective, that's a little bit different than just, well, I got it all figured out. You don't, you don't know anything unless God shows you what it's going on. So I had to kind of go through that process of learning that what I thought I understood about the love of God, I really didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason why I was uh, motivated to write this book. What parts of the Bible do you think give us the best indications of God's love for us? Are there a certain text or um, portions of it that really say, if you look at this, you can see how God loves us unconditionally? Well, um, I'll, I'll answer the question like this. Everyone is very familiar with John 316. You know, you'll go to sports events and you'll see people walking around with big posters with John 316 on it. And some people may actually say, what's that? Right. <laughs> and so right there, John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That passage is saying that when we did not care about God at all, he still loved us enough to send his son into the earth. And people say, well, why would you send your son to do something like that? Well, you need to understand who God is a little bit, that if Jesus is coming into the world, this is the, if you will, the manifestation of the presence of God in a man to show us what God is like. So everything about Jesus was to represent a relationship that could be established between man and his God. And not just this distant thing of somebody up in the sky, but Jesus came to bring us a clear revelation of who God is. And one of the first things that people understood about Jesus is that whenever he talked about God, he said, this is my father. Hmm. It's very, very relational conversation. So in John 3:16 we're shown there that God gave his only begotten son because there was no other way to fix this huge issue of the separation between God and man because of something that happened thousands and thousands of years ago in the garden. And most people are familiar with that story, yeah. but God coming into the world through Jesus Christ should give us an indication of how much God loved us when we didn't care about him. Exactly. If God loves you so much that he gives you his only son, yes. that is a true testament to his love. That is for sure. Your book mentions a move away from lifeless institutional traditions. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Man, I know we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this, but <laughs> let's just, just, just do it. Um, yeah. There is, okay, let me just say it this way. I know that people when they're trying to establish a relationship with God, the first thing they'll do is, well, I need to go to church. You know, if you're in a Christian nation like the United States, 
and you're trying to make this connection with God, you think, well, I just need to go to church. And you'll hear people say all the time, I need to get back into church. I need to go to church. I need to find a church. And when they go to church, they're given how things are done in the church. And they'll sit there and they'll hear good music and they'll hear preaching and they'll feel like they've got a connection with God. But then when you move beyond that and you find out all of the traditions that might be in a particular denomination, a particular church, well-meaning people set up things to help us to become more disciplined in the way that we express our relationship with God. However, those traditions may not have the life of God in them because they just keep us moving in a mechanical uh, operation without actually digging into the heart of the matter, which is if you're going to go to church, go there to build a relationship with God. Learn things that when you leave the church, you are on your way to developing a very real relationship. And what people have done is they just gotten religious and they leave all of their religious thinking, actions, and beliefs in a two hour segment on a weekend in a church. And many churches just don't allow the life of God to flow into them for a number of different reasons. So when you're really looking for God, you're, you're saying, I see this Bible. I want the kind of relationship that I see people had in this book. How do I get that? That calls for a heart crying out to God saying, please help me. I'm going to all these different places and I see people that seem like they know who you are, but I don't know who you are. You gotta help me. And that's for everyone. Everyone needs to say, how do I get close to you? Cause I don't know what I'm doing. So do you think it's a matter of maybe foregoing some of the formalities of services, mass church, whatever your Christian practice is, and getting into a more personal relationship with God, someone you talk to, uh, perhaps on an hourly basis, even someone who's always in your heart, someone who's impacting every decision you make? I love the way you said that. It requires both, man, because here's the thing. My book is about God's love is different, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot learn to love in a vacuum. You can't, you cannot mature in a vacuum. So there needs to be, of course, what I said to begin with, this heart that cries out to know God, but in the same time of you developing this relationship with him, going to the word, praying, doing all those things that everybody knows that they need to do. There is this other dynamic that God established that we do need to build relationships with each other. The thing that I have about the church is we can get so locked down in our traditions, we're not allowing the flow of the Spirit of God to release more and more insight on what we need to be doing to grow as a body of people together to reach people that are lost. So if we're going to do this thing the way that God intended it, there has to be the independent individual that on their own they're going to read they're going to study they're going to do all these things but as they do that when they walk away from that situation they walk into an environment where they're with people that they can help build or those people can help build that individual but the body of christ is a body for a reason we're relational we have to have the relationships to allow the love of god to be matured in us, which means at times you'll be dealing with people that are very irritating and God sets them in your life on purpose to help you to grow in your patience, long suffering, kindness, goodness, the things that are there by the, by the spirit of God, those fruit that we talk about, all those things need to be worked out when you're dealing with people that are not that lovely. So you have to have this individual pursuit, which we can just say, you gotta be hungry for God, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you've gotta have this passion for people. And when you have the passion for people, they, you all can work together. I can work with a person and a person can work with me and build me up and together we're getting stronger. And what are we doing? We're desiring to release more and more of that love that God has put on the inside of us first in the safety of our own fellowships and houses of worship and all that. But then the main thing that the Lord wants us to do is if you're growing and you're going to represent me, then carry this message in love to people that don't know what they're doing. Carry the message to people that are hurting, people that are living in fear, people that are living in anxiety, people that are looking for breakthroughs. 
we're the ones that are going to be responsible people to carry that presence of God, that word of God, and they'll know that we're real when we communicate with them first by them sensing the love that flows out of us. But that love can only genuinely be given to us by God. So we're literally doing God's work when we comfort people, when we show them love, when we show them compassion. Yes. Um, yes. Let me ask you this. We yes. live in a world, I mean, society has changed by 180 degrees from <laughs> yeah. the time you were a child to now. Yeah. The type of violence, the type of hate, yeah. the type of massacres, the type of wars that we see today. Yes are unprecedented. Unprecedented. I mean, yes. somebody going into a school and murdering children, it's happening multiple times a year in the United States. Yes. What's going on? Are people turning against God? Is that why we see this type of evil that's so pervasive? We got to remember, when when Jesus came into the into the earth, and we began to see his ministry, one of the very first things that happened with him is he was baptized by John, and then he went into the wilderness, and then there was a confrontation that happened between him and Satan. And one of the things that Satan did is that he took Jesus supernaturally. You know, there's a lot of things that I'd love to be able to go into, but we don't have time to talk about it. But basically, Satan took Jesus into a, a spiritual realm to see all the nations of the world, all the nations of the world. And he said, Satan said, he said, all of this I will give you. And I'm thinking that the devil is thinking, all right, God sent Jesus into the world and he wants the world. So let me just help him. I'll give him the world. But it's not, it's not going to happen like that. Yeah. So Satan's showing him all of this. To, and he said, all this was given to me and I will give it to whom I please. And Jesus didn't rebuke him saying, no, devil, that, that's not true. Yeah, it is. When Adam and Eve did what they did in the garden, then the authority to run the world was given over to Satan. And that's why there's so much of a demonic interface in the high levels of activity that's happening in the world and even the lowest levels. So we can't, we can't forget that there is a demonic kingdom. Satan is not the only demonic force. There is a kingdom of the demonic, uh, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, powers of principalities, all that stuff's real. So when you're looking at what's going on in the world right now, you're seeing people are giving in more and more to the impulses that are coming from the powers of darkness, because at the same time that that's going on, the devil realizes that there's also a move of God in his people. There's this hunger. You're looking at somebody that's gotten caught up in the hunger of God, all right? There is this hunger that is being released into people for God. And as that happens, more and more, as you give yourself over to God and you fall in love with him, you'll find out that the love is not just some emotional thing, but that it's the presence of God to release the miraculous, to do the things that Jesus did. So as people are becoming more and more submitted to darkness because they're living in a world where they feel like, well, nothing matters anymore. They're just nihilistic. They're ready to, right. to kill themselves, you know? And all kinds of things that we would think back 40, 50 years ago that were off limits, there are no more limits anymore. Right. And as we see that people are moving away, there is this active, I hate to even say it this way, but there is this active move away from any kind of accountability to something that says, this is what God wants. And people are like, I don't want to do what God wants anymore. The more you see that, the people are giving themselves over to lawlessness yeah. and the devil is ready to pump that environment. So we're seeing people becoming more and more unrestrained. And at the same time, God is saying, church, do you see what's going on here? Why do you think I want you to be filled with my spirit, fall more deeply in love with me? Because as you love me, I'm going to release more of my authority, more of my power. And you can speak to these people that are out to destroy themselves and destroy everybody around them. Now that's a very cursory view of what's going on. But no, it was well said, very conflict. articulate, very eloquent. I think it's very, very true that people have become too sophisticated to realize that there is actually 
evil in this world. Yes. It does exist. Satan yes. does exist. Uh, yes. The intellectuals, the elites try to pretend it doesn't exist, but it does exist. Absolutely. A quick story back in the 1970s, the TV producers on Happy Days said Fonzie could only wear a leather jacket in one scene of every show because it sent the wrong message. He looked like a hoodlum in that jacket. Yeah. That is the type of morality that today sounds like you know, quaint or, you know, perhaps prudish, but it was yeah. right. They had a standard. Yes. You know, uh, yes, you know, we absolutely. need to set standards and we yes. need to find God's love. Pastor Jeff has written a wonderful book. It'll help you reconnect with God if you feel like you've lost him. It'll help you deepen your faith if you've already found him. If you haven't been introduced to him at all, this is a great first start. It is called God's Love is Different, a biblical theology on the love of God. It is a beautiful book. It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you view God. It'll change the way you view love. It just might change your life. Pastor Jeff, thanks so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you for having me and God bless you. God bless you, sir. Merry Christmas. It's around the corner. <laughs> thank yeah. you, sir. All right. Thank you. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.